So, hello. Thanks all for coming because I know it's Friday, it was a long week. <laughs> and so I'm Angela and together with my supervisors Fabian Velsinger and Laura De Lorenzis, we are currently studying phase field, multi-scale phase field modeling of fracture of short fiber reinforced polymers. So first of all, let me introduce the materials we're dealing with. They are basically manufactured by um, injection molding, which is a process that um, promotes and knows, uh, allows a high orientation. Um, so this is the typical microstructure we are getting in the short fiber reinforced polymers we, are ha we have. We're basically uh, working with three different materials. All of them have a polymeric matrix and uh, are reinforced by glass fibers. And as you can imagine, the key point of, uh, of this modeling is uh, the microstructure. So we need to take uh, the microstructure in account and how, how we do that. So which are the variables we need to incorporate the microstructure and to characterize the microstructure. So first, we would, um, we would uh, um, perform a micro CT scan in all the materials we do have. And when we have uh, once we have the, the CT images, the digital images, we would perform a segmentation algorithm, which basically gets rid of the grayscales and transform these grayscales into a binary val values. And once we have the binary values, we perform a segmentation, um, sorry, an erosion type algorith algorithm. And so we can isolate the fibers themselves. So we can obtain the fiber orientation tensor, which is here called N, and basically uh, contains in an average sense um, the direction of all the fibers in a volume control. So when we have this uh, fiber orientation tensor, which is a second order tensor, um, we can, of course, we can plot the principal values and we can already see the shell core effect that I just saw in the previous image. Ooh. And, <laughs> sorry. And besides this fiber orientation tensor, we are also interested in other, other parameters, such as the fiber length, of course. So that's why we plot the density function, the, distribu the distribution. And we can see the um, fiber length uh, average is around 250 microns. And also we are interested, for example, in how the Young's modula is dependent on the orientation. And that's why we... Um, we perform some tension tests in dog bones under different uh, angles to see how the Jung's modulus is dependent on the orientation. And we can see it's ranging from around 11 gigapascals to around 5 gigapascals. And besides this, we're also interested, of course, in the fab fiber volume contents, the diameter. So when we have um, this microstructure characterized, we, as I said, we have the fiber orientation tensor, which is a second order tensor. And of course, we can perform a spectral decomposition of this tensor, right? So we can obtain the eigenvectors, which here are called n, and we obtain the eigenvalues, which he here are called lambdas. These lambdas are related by a mathematical constraint because they need to sum up to one. So out of these three eigenvalues, we can get rid of one of them, and we can s um, keep just two degrees of freedom, lambda one and lambda two. This means all the real possible microstructures can be plotted in a two-dimensional um, plot graph, depending of lambda one and lambda two. And the result would be a triangle. This triangle, which has, of course, three vertexes because it's a triangle, and every vertex represents an extreme uh, microstructure, extreme uh, configuration of the fiber. So we, we would have the isotropic, the unidirectional, and the planet isotropic. So basically, all real possible microstructures can be represented by a fiber orientation tensor that is lying inside the triangle. So, <coughs> as I said, I have my elements inside the integration point. I, I, I can link to a uh, orientation distribution, which is characterized by the fiber orientation tensor, and then I can, uh, I can locate my real microstructure within the triangle. But in order to promote accuracy, I am discretizing this, um, this triangle. So basically, in an offline phase, I am um, creating a lot of microstructures. I create them virtually with a fiber genera generator. And then I perform some micro micromechanical computations in order to characterize mechanically the um, microstructures I virtually created. And once I have 
um, uh, characterized in a mechanical way my microstructures, I link them um, to certain nodes of my big triangle. So I'm making smaller triangles out of my big triangle. And then I have my real microstructure and I can locate it in a small triangle within the big one and I can interpolate the constitutive response by linear combination of the mechanical response of the uh, three nodes of the triangle. And this would be the, the key concept of the fiber inter uh, orientation <coughs> interpolation, which is, as I said, is um, a two phases. So we have the offline phase when we create the uh, microstructures and the online phase in which we are uh, computing our real uh, microstructures. And so we need to link this with, uh, with phase field, right? Because we are interested in the fracture. So, so far we are using Emilio Martinez Pañeda UMAT, um, which is, um, is taking advantage, advantage of the analogy between the heat transfer problem and the phase field problem. So basically we are uh, using the displacement, the displacement temper temperature coupled elements, the C3, D8, T elements. And so for us, of course, the temperature has the meaning of the damage field. Um, so this would be the full algorithm we are basically using. Um, I know it's a lot of text, but you can take a look afterwards. And basically, in the uh, initial step, where in we initiali initialize the step, and we um, update all the conditions so we can update the load. And then, in my elements, I can perform the spectral decomposition of the fiber orientation tensor, and then I can locate my microstructure in within the triangle, and I can perform I get the nodes and the weights, and by linear combination, and I get uh, my deformations, and th I, can I need to transform these trains in the local coordinate of system, and then I compute the nodal history. With nodal, I mean the nodes of the triangle. And then I compute effective history and uh, the driving force via interpolation again, and then I can compute the fracture phase field and then I compute the nodal energy, the effective energy with nodal, again, I mean the nodes of the triangle within um, the, the um, interpolation concept, and then um, I can compute the displacement field. And it's very important, the backwards transformation, because all these calculations were done in the local coordinate of system, and again, I need to come back to the global coordinate of system. And this would be a uh, uh, representation how we, we perform the micromechanical simulation. So this is an example. For instance, um, this represents the isotropic uh, configuration. So um, we, we create this uh, microstructure uh, virtually, and we submit this structure to six different load conditions. So basically, we can get the anisotropic, anisotropic stiffness matrix. And in, in this matrix, mm -hmm. we only need 21 uh, values. These values, we store them in a database, which is basically an EXML file with that we transform um, afterwards into an H5 file. And for the individual phases, we are considering these values. And uh, the effective fracture properties we are considering are basically an assumption. Because we are using this formula to get GC, and GC is constant for all the microstructure, which is, of course, an assumption, because so far we don't have experimental values and we don't have a model but is this is under discussion. And this would be a visual representation of how the values, the parameters are varying um, in the in the within the triangle. So far we are using 45 different microstructures, which, which means that the triangle is discretized in 42 smaller triangles. And you can see the first component of the stiffness matrix, which is C1111, <laughs> how it's varying. Um, with lambda 1 and lambda 2, and also the other components of the matrix are varying in a similar way. And for GC, there is no variance because it's constant for all the kind of microstructures at that point. So we performed some premili preliminary experiments uh, with this uh, database, and so basically we are pulling um, uh, by two pins, we're pulling a CT sample. We are trying to mimic what is going to happen in the laboratory so far. And we, um, we made experiments for CTs that are have fiber alignment of 0, 30, 60, and 90 with respect of the load. And these, sa and these samples are really manufactured out of a plate. Um, so in order to consider this really uh, real orientation, we are mapping 
from the uh, orientation, fiber orientation from the plate to the CT samples that we are using Digimap in order to, uh, to map the donor mesh into the receiving mesh. Um, and in order to promote the efficiency of the process, because it takes long, we are just um, um, uh, making the computation in half of the CT sample. We are using two mixes. And these would be the results uh, due to the isotropy in the fracture, um, evolution of the cracks is straight, straight, and um, the fracture phase field, the damage field, is higher in regions with higher, highest fiber orientation. On the other hand, since uh, the elasticity is anisotropic, the stresses are higher in regions with higher fiber orientation. And these would be the numerical results. <coughs> um, the, the pins were moving 0.2 up and 0.2 down, so the total displacement would be 0.4. And we can already see like some different reaction forces depending on the fiber orientation with respect to the loading. And so this would be the summary and the outlook. Um, the interpolation coefficient, I would say, is the key point of this presentation, and also, and <laughs> and also the um, offline database training is very um, um, uh, new and novel in this uh, short fiber reinforced polymers. And thank you for your attention. And I I thank uh, New Frac project. <laughs>